On today's episode of Teaching Tech, I decide to continue with home injection molding. I break the world record for the world's biggest cold pool and the world's biggest clog. And finally, injection mold something, but at what cost? My hobby injection molded journey has been going for a long time now, and this latest chapter is filled with many more frustrations, perhaps reaching its conclusion. Let's start this installment with a quick recap. Firstly, my aims with this project, and primarily, I just want to do some hobby injection molding at home, and I want to use a machine that I purchased all the way back in 2014. And finally, I'd like to do so with recycled and ground up PLA prints, which I have a lot of. In the first video of this series, which I linked in the description, I went over my machine, comparing the modifications I had made to the stock form, including things like a PID temperature controller and converting it to run on 220 volts AC. I then explained that it had been sitting in my garage for quite a few years, which meant that much of it was completely seized, with this one rod being so jammed that it had to be bashed out, and then the valve re-drilled to a larger size, but that meant there was no off-the-shelf O-rings that fitted the gap. I was also having trouble with the temperature wildly fluctuating and PID auto-tune just not working. In part 2, I made some real progress, casting some custom silicon o-rings to seal the valve, although I still didn't quite get these the right size, and I machined a pretty nice two-part mould for a simple test bracket, although there was still stair-stepping on that due to me trusting the measurements of the cutter on the box rather than measuring it directly with calipers. But even so, after some cleanup with the Dremel tool, the mould was looking good enough for some preliminary tests, and I promised I wouldn't have part 3 until I had finally moulded something. And that brings us to this video, and you can probably tell by the delay, the process was character building. I started with trying to recast those silicon sealing washers, this time using some proper mould release on my 3D printed mould. I did my usual technique of squirting it in from one side, before giving it a day to cure, and then slicing off the excess with a sharp blade. However, when I then tried to pry them out, it turns out the mould release was not quite as good as the Vaseline I was using earlier. And worse still, even with all these new size variations, the thickness was just a little bit too big, so that meant yet another batch, this time a bit thinner. After I don't know how many attempts, I finally had some nice looking high temp washers to seal the valve. Remember this system uses air pressure, so it's important that the valve seals in between injection shots. So I put everything back together, turned on the heater, set it to 200 and started to load some waste plastic. But you can already see a problem in the making. The temperature was overshooting by a ridiculous amount and PID auto-tune did not work like the manual said it would. The plastic coming out was a charred mess and I even managed to set it on fire at one stage. This clip pretty much sums up how the whole process was going. Obviously, this lack of temperature control was a major safety hazard, so I headed to eBay to find a new controller, and most importantly, one that came with a manual describing PID auto-tuning. It arrived pretty quickly and even had a hard copy of the manual included. The pins for the wiring were exactly the same, so I switched it out, including the new solid-state relay as well as thermocouple. Now for the moment of truth, I turned on PID auto-tune, set the temp to 200, and watched the temperature steadily climb before it backed off and finally reached 200 perfectly. Thank goodness for that. With this new flexibility, I decided to add back a second heater, this one being a 220 volt silicon pad meant for transferring vinyl onto mugs. This machine originally came with a silicon heater in this exact configuration, but it was for 110 volts so I just removed it. With a bit of persuasion, it fit underneath the factory cover panels, with the covered wiring loom coming out of a newly drilled hole into the electronics box in parallel with the other heater. Earlier on, when the heater was way too hot, I managed to touch the air hose on it and melt some holes in the side. I first tried a dodgy fix, but ended up remaking the hose at a more appropriate length, and for once I actually did a good job remaking this and sealing it. So I was finally ready to injection mold some plastic, I turned on the compressor and something inside went bang. After that, it was making a strange noise and no air was coming out. It's not hard to imagine how overjoyed I was with this development. The system works on air, the compressor pressurizes the chamber, and then when we open the valve at the bottom, the plastic should be pushed through by the air. But the thing is, this injection molder was designed to be working with plastisol, which as you can see is quite runny like a liquid. 
so the recycled PLA that I was using was always going to be a lot more viscous and give this particular machine a hard time. So instead of buying another compressor, I thought it would be smarter to convert my machine to have a mechanical plunger. So time to start disassembling the bits I no longer needed and measuring what was left. And in place of the rotating stirrer, I would instead have a lead screw and a plunger. And here was my design, the grey part being the lead screw which had an M4 bore in the bottom. I would use a bolt to trap a large washer, and then have two aluminium halves, the bottom one threaded to bolt the two together, and then to seal the chamber, a large silicon washer that I would cast, just like I cast the O-rings for the valve. The reason I needed a washer is that because of the way the lid operated, I couldn't have the plunger be as wide as possible, otherwise it would hit as the lid closed, as demonstrated here on this printed prototype. So I lowered down the diameter until the plunger would clear and then milled the final version from aluminium. While that was happening, I drilled and then tapped holes to mount the lead screw nut on top and started to fill up my silicon washer mold with the same high temperature silicon as before, going back to Vaseline as a mold release. And I clamped a greased up piece of plastic on top to squish all of the silicon flat. I then tapped the threads on the machined plunger, assembled the two halves with the bolt and washer in the middle, and then, using Loctite, torqued up the bolt into the end of the lead screw. In my opinion, all of this part ended up looking pretty neat. If you're wondering about the silicon washer, well, that part didn't go so well. It proved to be patchy as best as I removed it from the mold. Despite this, I did still end up installing it, which was a complete disaster as the edges disintegrated and had to be cleaned out of the plastic mix. I ended up trimming it flush anyway, so just pretend that it never existed. With the lid open, I could screw the plunger assembly into place, and once the lead screw had poked through, installed the winder that I had recycled from the original assembly. Somehow at this point, I was foolishly optimistic about injection molding some PLA. The first job was removing the old burnt PLA sludge from the bottom of the chamber. And at the time, that was a world record for the world's largest warm pool. With this done, I could finally utilize my many kilos of ground up PLA waste prints pouring them into the chamber until it was almost full, and I had to do this because the lead screw was too short and the plunger wouldn't reach the bottom. I then heated up the chamber and let it sit for some time for the plastic to melt, and then started to wind the plunger down until it touched the top of the plastic. Once I had some dripping of plastic from the exit of the nozzle, I prepped the mold, coating it in Vaseline and inserting all of the hardware. And finally, the mold could be put into position, seated against the nozzle, and I wound the plunger down as far as I could. Wasn't exactly clear whether the plastic was entering the mold or not, but after I removed it, I could see it was in fact full. I may have mentioned before that with this type of thing, I am quite impatient. So as you can see, I popped this in the freezer to accelerate the cooling. After all of the clamping bolts were out, I still had to pry the two halves of the mold apart. And when I finally separated the two, the part was unfortunately in pieces. Furthermore, in my efforts to remove the rest of the plastic, it destroyed it even further. The end result looking like this. Ouch. Time for attempt number two, this time with some refinements. I couldn't tell when the mold was full because the two exit holes in the mold were too small for the plastic to flow out of. So my first change was expanding these with a drill. I also spent some further time with the Dremel trying to smooth out some of the stair stepping present in the mold from the previous machining error. After this, I cleaned up and lubricated the mold with Vaseline once more. After clamping everything back up, I made one more change wedging the mold against the hot underside of the machine so it too could heat up, hopefully allowing the plastic to flow through the mold more easily. After a while, I mounted the mold properly against the nozzle and turned the plunger until plastic could be seen oozing out of the exit holes on each side. Surely with these changes, this would be more successful. This time, I avoided the freezer and forced myself to be patient. Concerningly, there was a bit of shrinkage in the entry hole, but apart from that, everything looked legit. But the second time, the mold needed some persuasion to separate back into two halves, and despite my changes, I was horrified to find that my molded piece inside had disintegrated once more, which was only exacerbated by the rest of the removal process. At this point, I started thinking more about the material I was using. This was PLA that had already been heated up and printed, before being ground back down into small chunks, where it had been sitting in this bucket for years now. Whether it's the repeated heat cycles or the absorption of moisture, this PLA was incredibly brittle. And I had some virgin PLA pellets that I could have mixed in, but I'd rather save that for filament making. I shared my frustrations with my patrons, and in response, Derek found this injection molding guide for PLA. Here are some highlights. It's critical that the PLA is dried to remove as much moisture as possible. It should then be kept in an inert nitrogen atmosphere and ideally injection molded within 15 minutes of exposure to atmospheric conditions. 
My take home from this is that even if I mixed in virgin pellets, I was going to have an uphill battle to make PLA work. Fortunately, I also had some virgin ABS pellets on hand. These are also about 10 years old, so I gave them a spell in my dehydrator. While this was happening, I had the opportunity to clean out the PLA from the system, and it was at this point that I set the record for the world's biggest cold pool. This gave me some level of accomplishment, and happened to leave the chamber surprisingly clean. Time to go again with ABS pellets straight out of the dryer. I vaselined up the mold, wedged it against the machine to heat up, and set a starting chamber temperature of 240 degrees Celsius. I let the heat soak through for almost an hour, but turning the plunger caused it to jam, and no amount of turning would get any plastic to seep through the nozzle. So I upped the chamber temperature all the way to 300 and let it sit for some more time. But once more, it would not extrude. So I opened the lid and saw that it was molten, but not really to the point where it was fluid enough to flow through the nozzle and into a mold. The plunger had also come unscrewed, which needed rescuing. With the machine turned off but still hot, I decided to clean out as much ABS as I could, and I considered this the world record for clearing the world's largest clog. It's a monster and a stinky one too. Desperate to fulfill my promise of molding something for this video, I put them all together and this time used some hot glue. And let me say that this was so convenient compared to using the machine. I kept pumping it in until it exited the sides, and then topped up the entrance to account for any shrinkage. Once cooled, this one wasn't super easy to remove, but still significantly easier than my PLA experiments. Once I had provided some assistance, the two halves of the mold were split, and I did manage to pull out the completed part, which actually felt slimy instead of sticky because of the Vaseline coating the mold. The two screws came out nicely, and the only thing left to do on this part would to be to cut off the entry and exit points, and maybe wash off that greasy Vaseline. And funnily enough, a few days after I had done this, Stefan from CNC Kitchen released a video in which he turned hot melt glue into actual filament. So I guess great or maybe unhinged minds think alike. So I did kind of get a part, if you ignore the fact that I didn't actually use this machine. And overall, I think I won't continue with this. I have ground up many kilos of PLA just waiting to be recycled into something else. And fortunately, I have other options to probably use it more effectively like making spools of filament, using a mix of virgin and ground up plastic, and I've already made a video demonstrating the use of a clothing heat press to recycle waste prints into beautiful plastic sheets that happen to be great for laser cutting. I'm using this machine very differently to the way it was intended, and despite all of the modifications I've already done to assist with this, it probably needs another rebuild just to seal it up properly. It's also clear that the plastic is not being melted evenly with a cooler spot in the middle of the chamber. To combat this, industrial injection molders have a narrow passage surrounded by band heaters with a screw down the middle that serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it will push the plastic towards the mold, but it will also assist in distributing the pellets evenly and the friction created from the screw will help melt them. I feel like if I was going to make further modifications, this is the type of thing I should be aiming for. And maybe that would cut down on some of the hot spots that cause the filament to smoke and stink out my whole house. Alternatively, I could follow the suggestions in the comments and build a Buster Beagle 3D injection molder, and these look really nice, but there's still one fundamental problem. And that's that I don't actually have a project that needs injection molding. I've been doing all of this all these years just for fun, but I didn't actually find the process very enjoyable. Maybe the silver lining from this is that this injection molded glue has some merit, so perhaps if you want to see some more testing and the process completed with 3D printed molds, let me know in the comments section. Thank you so much for watching and for sharing my pain. And until next time, happy avoiding ejection molding at home. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.